Tonight's top EU stories from the UNIT website include Canada and European Union reach free trade deal after four years of talks. EU Energy Commissioner faces questions over fossil fuel subsidy data. Fingerprints in European passports legal EU court rules. European Union lawmakers freeze plan to cap food for fuel. Plus, top of the class, Britain is the best pupil at obeying edicts from Strasbourg, says top Eurocrat. I'm Rick Timmis and this is the Unit Nightly News. First, from our homepage, Canada and the European Union reached an agreement in principle on a free trade treaty that brings near an end to more than four years of negotiations. Canadian Prime Minister Stephen Harper and European Commissioner President Jose Barroso announced the agreement today following a meeting in Brussels. The pact, which would need the approval of EU national governments and the European Parliament, will eliminate about 98% of all Canadian and EU tariff lines on the first day of its implementation. The sticking points have included Canadian access to the EU's beef and pork markets and European access to Canada's dairy market, as well as to Canadian public procurement contracts at the sub-federal level. Now, I like to look at the facts behind the stories that come across my desk. It's all too easy for the political spin doctors to leave out crucial reference material, leaving us to conclude a false position. For this article, I'm going to um, refer to Wikipedia and let it do the talking. The links are below. And do consider making a donation to them when you go and visit the site. British-Canadian relations are the bilateral relations between Her Majesty's Government in Canada and the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. London and Ottawa enjoy cooperative and intimate contact. The two countries are related through history, through language, through the Commonwealth of Nations and their sharing of the same head of state and monarch. Despite this shared history, Britain is no longer Canada's largest trading partner and the two nations are now in separate trade blocs, the European Union and the North American Free Trade Association, respectively. Despite Canada's long-term shift towards proportionally more trade with the US, Canada-UK trade has continued to grow in absolute numbers and reached an all-time high in 2006. The UK is by far Canada's most important commercial partner in Europe and from a global perspective ranks second behind the United States. The European Union's Energy Commissioner has been accused of attempting to conceal information on the full scale of the subsidies enjoyed by fossil fuels in a move that has angered supporters of renewable energy. German news site Sway Deutsch this week reported that Commissioner Gunther Ottinger crossed out controversial figures estimating subsidies for fossil fuels in a draft of an up-and-coming communication on the EU electricity market. The draft copy of the Commission's communication on delivering the internal electricity market and making the most of public intervention suggested renewable energy suppliers received 30 billion euros of public support in 2011, compared to 26 billion for fossil fuel companies. Now here's a thought for you. That's a total subsidy of 56 billion euros. Did you wonder how all those solar panel and loft insulation companies suddenly appeared from nowhere? Well folks, you paid for them subsidised with your taxes. It would appear that the kleptocrats in Brussels are also ashamed of the figures. The EU speaks with forked tongue. It will force public fire sales of post offices and Royal Bank of Scotland when it sees fit, and yet it will massively subsidise the energy sector. Now what seems to me to be distinguishing factor is that where the RBS and post offices are owned by UK taxpayers, the energy companies are owned by French, German and, as reported last week, Polish companies. Does it not strike you as odd that the EU bleats illegal state aid when it wants to sell UK assets for cents on the euro, but sings about industrial aid and support when it wants to fund foreign industries? <music> D. 
The European Union's highest court rejected on Thursday a German man's challenge to the inclusion of his fingerprints in his passport, saying such data helped to prevent identity fraud and to curb illegal immigration. EU rules requiring newly issued biometric passports to include fingerprints came into effect in 2004. Though a full rollout has taken many years, they apply to all EU member states except Britain and Ireland. The contested measures pursue the general interest objective of preventing illegal entry into the EU, the European Court of Justice said in its statement. Well, that's the biggest load of cobblers I have ever heard. This does nothing to avert the problem of immigration. Look at the story that we covered a fortnight ago about African migrants arriving in Italy, being given temporary EU visas, 500 euros, and then sent off into Northern Europe. This is about tagging the populace. It's about branding the sheeple of Europe. Hear these words from the book of Revelation, 1316. And he causes all, the small and the great, and the rich and the poor, and the free men and the slaves, to be given a mark on their right hand or on their forehead. And he provides that no one will be able to buy or to sell except the one that has the mark, either na the name of the beast or the number of his name. EU lawmakers deferred on Wednesday plans to curb the use of fuels made from food crops, providing a reprieve for some in the bioenergy industry, but raising the risk of higher grain prices in the future. The decision breaks for now a policy U-turn from the European Commission, the EU executive, which had said certain kinds of biofuels had to be limited after earlier encouraging them. But on Wednesday, the European Parliament Environment Committee failed to give the go-ahead for EU negotiators to begin work on a legal text to implement the cap, making it unlikely anything can be agreed before 2015. The proposal has divided EU member states and the industry. Those involved in turning crops into fuel, known as first-generation biofuels, argued more time and more hard evidence was needed before a policy shift. Biofuels, such as ethanol made from sugar or biodiesel from rapeseed, are blended with conventional transport fuels and added to vehicle tanks. They were meant to reduce transport carbon emissions and cut Europe's dependence on imported oil. But evidence began to emerge that Europe's thirst for biofuels was inflating global food prices and that some biofuels were even more harmful to the climate than fossil fuels. Well, interestingly, this is, of course ties back to the trading levies the EU imposed on Mexican and South American bioethanol that we looked at last week. Things are hotting up across the energy sector. Pun intended. And just in time for the European winter. Britain is the best pupil in the class for obeying edicts from Strasbourg, a senior Eurocrat declared today. Thor John Jaglund, Secretary General of the Council of Europe, said that the rest of the continent looked to the UK to set an example of human rights, so it must let convicts have the vote. His comments sparked fury among MPs who accused him of talking patronising drivel. They said that given Britain had such a long track record of implementing judgments by the European Court of Human Rights, judges should realise they had made a major mistake by ruling it was an unlawful to deny prisoners the vote. Britain is locked in a standoff with Strasbourg over the ruling. Oh, I love stories like this. It's not the content that gets me excited. It's the camouflaged admission that the EU law is supreme over British law and that our parliament has lost its sovereignty. I was at a Remembrance Sunday church service yesterday where we sung the national anthem. One line really struck a chord with me. The second verse calls that she, the Queen that is, will defend our laws. What a shame that her politicians have cleverly usurped her authority. Personally, I'm not a massive supporter of monarchies, as I believe in placing power with the free voice of a democratic people. But it is such a shame that nothing like enough of us will get up, stand up and speak out. Today in our video library, well, talking of getting up and speaking out, here is a man that makes no apologies for voicing his opinion with grit and gusto. In this short video we see Nigel Farage taking to the floor of the European Parliament and upsetting Mr Rumpoy again. This is quality entertainment at its finest and when Mr Rumpoy comes back all agitated and vexed, well what better opportunity to kick sand in his eye and give him another verbal whipping. Excellent work Nigel. 
I'm Rick Timmis, reporting for the unit, Nightly News. I'll see you soon. <laughs>